Welcome to the Title IX training for the 2020-2021 academic year. This training will cover an overview of the recent changes to Title IX, the legal obligations colleges and universities must comply with, how to report an alleged incident of sexual harassment, and the obligations of employees regarding reporting. I will discuss the current policy and procedures and point out significant change as we go along. On May 6, 2020, the Office of Civil Rights, Department of Education, released new federal regulations under Title IX. The document that was released on May 6 was over 2,000 pages. Institutions were required to have an updated and compliant policy in place by August 14 of 2020. This gave institutions a very short turnaround time to execute the rule. The regulations apply to students, faculty, and staff. They have a substantially expanded due process, which you will hear me refer to as a grievance process as we move through the training. Institutions are required to state a presumption that the respondent is not responsible until a determination has been reached. The definitions of sexual harassment under the new regulations have a much narrower scope. The Title IX team works together to ensure Gustavus Adolphus College is in compliance with all Title IX regulations. Although the Title IX coordinator is the primary contact for all questions and reports regarding Title IX and sexual misconduct, any member of the team can be contacted for questions and or reports. Members of the Title IX team are Patty Dawson, Title IX coordinator, Tommy Valentini, Deputy Coordinator, and Michelle Rosinko, Deputy Coordinator. Title IX was enacted into law in 1972. Its purpose is to prohibit federally funded educational institutions from discriminating against students or employees based on sex. In 2011, a Dear Colleague letter was issued that brought the response to sexual harassment on college and university campuses to the forefront. We are now strictly working under the new regulations in regards to sexual harassment. This training focuses on the reporting and the process of allegations of sexual harassment under the new regulations, but we must not lose sight of differential treatment under Title IX, such as in athletics, admission, the classroom, or the employment context. Differential pay based on sex, inequities within an athletic department, admission to a specific academic program based on sex are all examples of differential treatment. Reports may be issued to the Title IX coordinator regarding any incidents of differential treatment and will be adjudicated under the appropriate process as outlined in the policy. As stated earlier, the scope of sexual harassment under Title IX has changed. The new regulations state that once the college has actual knowledge of an alleged incident of sexual harassment that occurred within an educational program or activity within the United States, we must respond within the process laid out in the regulations. The regulations refer to actual knowledge being once the Title IX coordinator has been put on notice of sexual harassment or allegations of sexual harassment. So at a minimum, the college's education program or activity includes all of the operations of the college, including locations on campus or otherwise owned or controlled by the college, locations, events, or circumstances over which the college exercised substantial control over both the respondent and the context in which the alleged sexual misconduct occurred, and any building owned or controlled by a student organization that is officially recognized by the college. So whether the conduct occurred in the college's education program or activity is really a fact-specific analysis. The definitions of sexual harassment are much narrower than they were pre-regulations. Conduct on the basis of sex that satisfies one or more of the following, quid pro quo, hostile environment, and BAWA crimes, which are sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. Title IX quid pro quo harassment occurs when an employee of the college, including a student employee, conditions the provision of an aid, benefit, or service of the college on an individual's participation in unwelcome sexual conduct. Examples of 
Unwelcome sexual conduct could include sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, sexually motivated physical contact, or other verbal or nonverbal communication of a sexual nature. Conduct is unwelcome when the individual did not request or invite and regarded it as undesirable or offensive. The fact that an individual may have accepted the conduct does not mean that they welcomed it. Title IX, Hostile Environment Harassment. It's unwelcome conduct on the basis of sex, determined by a reasonable person to be so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the college's education program or activity. Circumstances that may be considered when determining whether conduct was so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive may be the frequency of the conduct, the nature and severity of the conduct, whether the conduct was physically threatening, whether the conduct was directed at more than one person, whether the conduct arose in the context of other discriminatory conduct, whether the speech or conduct deserves the protection of academic freedom. And some examples of unwelcome sexual harassment might be touching, obscene language, off-color jokes, sexually degrading comments of an individual, all based on their sex, and of course, cyber harassment, like disseminating information, photos or videos of a sexual nature without a person's consent would also be an example of hostile environment. Title IX sexual harassment. Under Title IX, we must respond to sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. The new regulations have aligned this with the definitions consistent with the Violence Against Women Act, which you'll hear me refer to as VAWA and CLERI. Definitions can be found in detail in the policy on the Title IX webpage. An institution's response must be prompt and not deliberately indifferent. An institution would be deliberately indifferent if the response was clearly unreasonable in light of the known circumstances. The institution must also follow the grievance process outlined in the new regulations. Before I move further into reporting obligations in the process, I want to say that while these new regulations have caused changes to our policy and process that many argue will deter reporting, Gustavus remains committed to serving anyone who has been harmed by sexual harassment or interpersonal violence. Resources, supportive measures, and accommodations will always remain available to reporting parties. You can start to see how the scope has narrowed under Title IX. There are also requirements under the Violence Against Women Act, which institutions are required to respond to reports of sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. VAWA, however, has no jurisdiction over where the alleged incident took place, so this would move, would move it out of the Title IX response, but still require the institution to respond. There are also other incidents of sexual misconduct that may be reported and the institution will respond to. The regulations state we can adjudicate the incidents that fall outside the narrow scope of Title IX, but we must respond per the regulations for all incidents that fall under the narrow scope of Title IX. Our policy is written to address both alleged incidents of Title IX and non-Title IX. Clery Act is another federal law that involves the reporting of certain types of crimes, which include sex crimes. Cleary is specific to college property and adjacent property. It is put in place to promote campus safety and consumer protection. Most of us in the Gustavus community are required to report Cleary crimes. It can be so confusing at times to remember what we are supposed to report and to whom. When in doubt, please reach out to the Title IX office or campus safety with questions and clarification on reporting obligations. There are other laws that may overlap when there are reports of sex discrimination, such as FERPA, state mandatory reporting laws, Title VII anti-discrimination, and disability accommodation laws, to name a few. Employee reporting obligations have not changed. Gustavus requires all employees who are not confidential resources to report alleged incidents of sexual misconduct to the Title IX coordinator. Reporting this information will ensure complainants are receiving the supportive measures that are available to them 
while still providing them autonomy over the how they wish to move forward. Confidential resources are available for anyone that wishes to report, receive support, or discuss options. Keep in mind that reports made to confidential resources do not provide the immediate support of supportive measures, or do they initiate any type of report to the institution. Confidential resources in our community are advocates from the Sexual Assault Response Team, counselors in the Counseling Center, health service professional staff, chaplains, and CADA advocates. When filing a report, you should include as much information about the alleged incident as possible, names, location, dates, etc. Reports can be made to the Title IX coordinator in person, by mail, email, or phone. You can also use the online reporting form that can be found on the Title IX website. Anonymous reporting is available, but keep in mind, the institution has little to work with to initiate any sort of response if they receive an anonymous report. They will, however, use that information to look for patterns of behavior. If you are unsure whether or not to report, your best option is to contact the Title IX coordinator to discuss. Once the Title IX coordinator receives a report, they will arrange a meeting with the complainant. This initial meeting is not considered a formal complaint. At this meeting, supportive measures will be offered, option for reporting will be discussed, including reporting to law enforcement. The complainant has autonomy over how the process moves forward and regardless of their decision, still receives supportive measures. Supportive measures are non-punitive, non-disciplinary, individualized services that are offered as appropriate without fee to either party before or after a complaint has been filed. Supportive measures are designed to restore or preserve equal access to a program or activity without burdening either party. Examples of supportive measures include a mutual no contact order, change in work or class schedule, access to counseling or medical services. If a reporting party decides to move forward with a formal complaint, the Title IX coordinator must receive a signed formal complaint. This can be done in writing or in email format. In rare circumstances, the college may need to move forward with a formal complaint. This would happen in situations where there may be a threat to the community. If there is no formal complaint, the process stops, but supportive measures are still available to the complainant and they may change their mind in the future about making a formal complaint. The formal signed complaint initiates the grievance process. Both parties will receive a detailed notice of allegations. This will include their rights under the process, including the statement that the respondent is not responsible until a determination has been made. The notice also will include detailed instructions for next steps in the process. They will be giving information regarding the role of the advisor in the process. The process must be equitable. It must allow for review of evidence by both parties. Decision makers must be trained, free from bias or conflict of interest, and we must work on a prompt time frame. Both parties have the right to an advisor of their choice. Advisors are a requirement of the live hearing, and this is new under the regulations. Their role is to conduct cross-examination questions directly, orally, and in real time on behalf of their party to both witnesses and parties. Advisors are permitted to attend meetings and interviews, but they may not act on behalf of their parties. Advisors can be lawyers if that is what the party chooses. If a party does not have an advisor, the college will provide an advisor to serve in that role on their behalf. Under the new regulation, informal resolution may be an option for some incidents. Both parties must agree to use this process. It cannot be initiated without a formal complaint. The alleged party cannot be an employee of the college and the regulations state this includes student workers. This process leaves the decision power totally and strictly with the parties. The mediator does not decide what is fair or right. 
the mediator's role is to be the catalyst between the two parties. At any time, either party can opt out. If the informal resolution process is not successful or either party declines to participate, the complainant can either initiate the investigation phase or halt the process. Parties must sign an agreement to participate in this process and also to accept the outcome. As in the past, we will be using external investigators who will conduct a prompt and equitable investigation. Their role is to conduct interviews with both parties and witnesses and to collect evidence related to the incident. The investigators provide a written report that summarizes the investigation and that report is available for parties and their advisors to review as part of the grievance process. Parties and their advisors must also have access to all evidence during the investigation phase. Following the investigation is a live hearing. This is a substantial change and the one getting the most attention. This is a requirement of the new regulations. The hearing will be held by video conference with the parties, witnesses, and hearing panel located in separate locations. Parties will be able to simultaneously see and hear the party or the witness answering questions. Our hearing panel will consist of a three-person panel with one of the people acting in the role of the chair. The panel will moderate the hearing. The hearing panel will have reviewed the investigation report and all evidence prior to the live hearing. The panel may ask questions of the parties and the witnesses. Parties advisors, not the parties, can ask questions of the other party and of witnesses. This is the cross-examination phase. The panel will determine relevancy of the question before the other party is permitted to answer. If a party does not have an advisor present at the live hearing, the college will provide one con to conduct the cross-examination on behalf of that party. Cross-examination must take place in order to be compliant under the new regulations. If a party or witness declines to answer any questions during the hearing, that party's or witness's previous statements cannot be considered by the hearing panel. The hearing panel makes a decision based on the preponderance of evidence standard, and this is the standard we have currently been using. If applicable, sanctions will be imposed as necessary to end the misconduct, prevent its recurrence, and address its effects. In determining sanctions, the hearing panel will consider the severity of the misconduct, the need to protect the community, the particular facts and circumstances of the matter, and any previous conduct violations by the respondent. Parties will be notified simultaneously of the outcome of the hearing in a detailed written notice of outcome. The option to appeal must be offered to both parties. Appeals will be decided by a member from the provost team and two decision makers that were not part of the process in any way up to this point. Either party may appeal the original hearing panel's decision of responsibility on the grounds of procedural irregularity that affected the outcome of the matter, newly discovered evidence that could affect the outcome of the matter, and or the Title IX team personnel had a conflict of interest or bias that affected the outcome of the matter. Sanctions, if applicable, that are imposed by the hearing panel will not go into effect unless and until the hearing panel's decision is upheld or the deadline for appeals has expired. For this reason, the regulations require a reasonably prompt timeframe for the appeals process. This training has covered the process in which we respond under the Title IX regulations. Allegations of sexual misconduct that are not Title IX sexual harassment will use the same investigation process as Title IX matters, but will not have a live hearing. The Title IX coordinator will appoint a panel of three decision makers to adjudicate. The decision makers will review the report and evidence submitted by the investigators. They may seek additional information from the investigator, the parties, or other individuals involved in order to make a determination. They will operate under the same evidentiary standard and review of information as in the Title IX process. The college is committed to protecting the rights of the complainant, the respondent, and anyone else involved in the complaint resolution process. Any conduct constituting retaliation or interference with the process is a violation 
of our policy, and it is subject to disciplinary action. Concerns regarding retaliation should be reported to the Title IX coordinator. The Title IX coordinator is responsible for the coordination of the college's Title IX compliance efforts, including the college's efforts to end sexual misconduct, prevent its recurrence, and address its effects. The coordinator oversees and monitors the college's overall compliance with Title IX related policies and the administration of policy. The new regulations include record keeping requirements and training requirements for members of the Title IX process that also are managed by the Title IX coordinator. Again, do not hesitate to reach out to a member of the team with any questions or concerns. As a member of the Gustavus community, I hope you will take time to review the policy that can be found on the College Title IX webpage. Be an active bystander. If you see behavior that cultivates an environment of sex discrimination, say something. Some situations can be addressed in the moment and others may require more assistance or can be addressed at a different time. It is our responsibility to step in and say something. Be kind to your fellow Gusties. Be respectful. Think about the words you are using or the actions you are taking and how they might affect another person. Again, please do not hesitate to reach out to the Title IX coordinator with questions or concerns. Contact information can be found on the Title IX website.